All right. Well, it is 6.30 and uh, time to begin our meeting. Uh, we uh, so call our meeting to order. I uh, have a roll call. I know that uh, I am here. Mark Boffman is uh, has an excused absence. Uh, Jerry Norman. I'm here. Mike Bresco. Here. And TC is not here with us yet, but I'm watching the attendees to see if he pops in here, which we think he will. So um, next up is the meeting accessibility. If uh, Evan, if you could please read that for us, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Give me just one second. Okay. Dope. Pursuant to the governor's emergency proclamation 20-25, the city is unable to provide an in-person location for the public to listen to the virtual planning commission meeting this evening. Meetings are still accessible to the public and public comment can be submitted. Each speaker is allowed up to three minutes for non-agenda comment, five minutes if you're representing an organization, and seven minutes for agenda public comment. Once you've dialed into the meeting, please virtually raise your hand to indicate you would like to provide public comment. Your mic will remain muted until you are called on during the public comment period. To, pro <clears throat> excuse me, to provide public comment, you may join the webinar via the link us06web.zoom.us backslash j backslash 82822648. Seven nine four, or by dialing the following number, 253-215-8782 and entering the webinar ID 828-226-48794 and then the pound sign. Back to you, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Amato. Excuse me. Thanks, Evan. Um, next up is approval of the agenda. Any changes? additions or deletions to the agenda from anyone? All right, we'll call the agenda approved by common consent. And it looks like TC has joined. He's in the attendees uh, lobby right now. I have just promoted uh, him to panelist. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is approval of the minutes. Any changes, corrections to the minutes from the last meeting? All right, we will call the... Uh, Minutes approved by common consent. And next up is non-agenda public comment. So if you have public comment not related to uh, the stormwater uh, design, the surface water design manual, um, we'll have three minutes to give your public comment. Uh, Evan, do we have anyone on the line for public comment? Uh, yes, we do. We have a couple of hands up. I will go ahead and uh, admit the first commenter. Ms. Wichter, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm Mary Wichter in Sammamish for 20 years. Um, I want, I did send an uh, email um, early this morning <laughs> on basin plans. They are part of stormwater, but what's happened is um, the basin plans that have been adopted by the city, um, they're kind of online all over the place and they need to be consolidated together. And because I've been a frequent flyer for submitting text amendments and dockets to the city to try to get code changes um, that during the process that you could make compound changes and then they realized that you could make text amendments to development regulation changes. There's a title 24 and that was all listed as interim comprehensive plan and um, all of it was repealed except when Miriam Leitner who's the uh, planning manager now. Um, when she removed those, she's not a stormwater person, so that couldn't be done. And they said, well, we'll fit it in sometime when there's stormwater stuff done. So I submitted all my history back to 2015 and 2016 when I first tried to find all the <laughs> basin plans. Um, and they, they need to be put together somewhere. There's maybe a code change or two adding a sentence. I don't know how this city wants to handle it. I did click on King County's today, KCC, and I forget the the number for it, but they have a lot of basin plans. And one of the reasons they do that is for all the unincorporated areas, um, since there aren't cities, King County is like the, the thing that does it. But when the city incorporated 831 of 1999 here, um, we became in charge of it. So there are some basin plans before 
Um, the city became a city that East Lake Sammamish Basin Plan and Non-Point Action Plan. And that's super important because when you do a drainage review and you go through like the special requirements, you're supposed to look for those. And if you happen to live in the Panhandle Subbasin, which is um, East Lake Sammamish Parkway Drive heading north to uh, Redmond, uh, it's really steep slopes there. And it's even dark at night. There aren't lights. I took photos recently. Um, and those areas need to be protected. And one of the things they would do would use a basin plan. And since there isn't an adopted one for the city, um, it would use, or it, it, that the city has done, it would use the ones that were adopted from King County before, which are those are in the title 24, um, 24.20 um, for basin plan. So it's very important data. It's important to use and understand. And it's just one of those kind of leftover things that didn't get part as a particular work plan. And I think it makes it the sense to put it with the things that we're discussing tonight, but I'm speaking in non-agenda since it's not there yet. And then I would like to say that I um, did get a copy of Paul Stigney's uh, comments on um, the things that should not be in this and shouldn't even be projects. And I pretty much agree with him on those. So I think you'll probably hear from him next. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Wichter. I will go ahead and promote the next caller. Mr. Stickney, whenever you're ready. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. Paul Stickney here. Sorry I couldn't attend your last meeting. Sent a little note that I was on a road trip. I'm going to explain that in a minute because there's a couple things that pertain to Sammamish that struck home on that trip. On the email I sent today on non-agenda, I'm not going to read it into in to the record. It's clear. I don't expect you to do anything about it. I just wanted to share opinions that what is E4 and E5 now that was E8 and E9 is basically overkill in Sammamish. The short story is, and I say this as fact because I've seen no evidence to the contrary, all town center projects that have been built have been built to the equivalent of current stormwater standards not too much development has happened in the city that was based on the new 2016 standards, and there's been no flooding from any of those. We need to work on uh, retrofit, which is what, and I approve all the changes that are coming in in the second part today. I may comment after I hear what's happening. Long story short, I went on a 4,400 mile road trip, went down to Palm Springs first, to work on selling my mom's manufactured home because my sister and I, she passed away a few years ago. The hot area and all the dust and things is not what either of us like. I had a caretaker there, a good friend of mine. He had a stroke, paralyzed half of his body and helped him move. I rented a cargo van. If you ever need a cheap cargo van, Enterprise is smoking hot on the rate. But I got down to Palm Springs, loaded all his stuff up, and took him to Roswell, New Mexico, and drove back. Quite the experience. But it had been four to five years since I'd driven down to California. 2017 was the last time. And I could not believe the difference in the uh, dryness and the forest fire scars and the lake levels it's real i mean it was amazing what i saw and coming back from oregon i noticed a lot of controlled uh, burns they were working on understory control to keep the forest fire season conflagrations i love that word even though i have a hard time saying it if you have too much fuel you can have something you just can't stop so there might be some things in the urban forestry plan to consider reducing urban fuel loads and actually reassessing tree canopy to preserve what we have and not losing it in a fire. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Stigney. That was the last of our callers. I'll turn it back over to you, Vice Chair Mato. Thank you very much. Um, looks like we're now down to uh, old business, a work session on updates to the King County Surface Water Design Manual. Um, and I don't know who is leading the presentation there, but I'd like to turn it over to, to them.
Good evening, commissioners and members of the public. Thanks for having us today. My name is Stephanie Sullivan. I'm a senior stormwater engineer at the city of Sammamish. Um, we're going to discuss the Sammamish Stormwater Code and King County Manual Addendum Update. So I'm also joined by our consultants with AHBL, Brittany Port and Stephanie Hindmarsh, who will be leading the discussion. Uh, they will present the proposed updates and give some insight to our suggested changes in the work we've done so far. So we look forward to having uh, getting your feedback on these suggestions. Um, all questions and comments will be logged and addressed and presented to you when we come back on April 21st for the public hearing. Uh, with that, if Brittany and Stephanie uh, are there when you're ready, please take that away. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let um, the other Stephanie <laughs> share her screen. Uh, there we go. Good evening, planning commissioners. Um, and thank you for having us back tonight to present on the city's stormwater code amendments and manual adoption. And as Stephanie Sullivan uh, alluded to, we are here tonight to brief you on the progress that we've made um, on the preparation of amendments to chapter 2103 and the city's local addendum to the King County surface water design manual. So as for our agenda for this presentation, we're going to first introduce the project team and then go through what the goals are for this project. We'll then provide an update as to where we are in the process and update you on our outreach efforts. Then Stephanie Heinmark is going to go through the proposed changes to both chapter 2103 and the Sammamish addendum to the King County Surface Water Design Manual. And then I will go ahead and um, take over from there and update you on the schedule moving forward and the next steps for the Planning Commission's review of this topic. And then the project team will be here for any questions you may have. So from the city, we have uh, Stephanie Sullivan, Senior Stormwater Engineer, who is the project manager for the project. My name is Brittany Port and I'm a land use planner with AHBL, who the city has brought on to prepare the amendments and assist with the public outreach and adoption. I also have my colleague Stephanie Heinmark here with me tonight to help present the changes that you're going to see in the code and addendum. Also with AHL is Wayne Carlson, who's not with us here tonight, but is a principal and provides oversight and QR for our work products. And then we also have from the city, the public works director, Audrey Starcy, who has been providing oversight for this project as well. This update to the city's stormwater code is fairly routine. Um, the update is typically done on a five-year cycle to meet the city's requirements under its NPDES municipal stormwater permit. The goal of this update would generally be to ensure that the city's stormwater code and manual are consistent with the minimum requirements, the thresholds, and the definitions that are contained within Appendix 10 of the NPDES permit um, that manage, uh, essentially require, requiring that stormwater is managed uh, to the maximum extent practicable for new development, redevelopment, and during construction. The city will be adopting the 2021 King County Surface Water Design Manual, which is a phase one program that has been approved by the Department of Ecology as being equivalent to the Department of Ecology's Stormwater Management Manual for Western Washington. The city is also updating its local addendum to the King County Surface Water Design Manual, which contains some amendments to the King County Manual that reflect local conditions or values for the city of Sammamish. These updates that we are proposing are not intended to change drainage review thresholds, requirements, or maps, um, and some of the more restrictive requirements that are implemented by the City of Sammamish's addendum um, will be maintained in this new addendum. So as mentioned, these are kind of routine updates that are just really to keep the city in line with its NPDES permit. Um, there are a few um, notable ones that we'll go through in this presentation. So as part of this project, the city has been seeking city staff and public review and feedback on the proposed amendments and adoption of the 2021 King County Manual and the Sammamish Addendum. We conducted a group discussion with city staff to go over changes to the addendum, identifying areas that staff has challenges with or would like to see additional information added to help with clarity and implementation. After receiving staff input on the addendum and stormwater code, we finalized a gap analysis and drafted amendments to Chapter 2103 and the Sammamish Addendum. We then held a public meeting to review the proposed changes with the public on March 31st. Six members of the public were in attendance at that meeting, and we had some really good discussion with several questions and comments provided as to the proposed changes, as well as just clarifying questions on how the stormwater manual is applied to new and redevelopment. 
And now we are here tonight to present to you the proposed changes and get feedback from the Planning Commission as you serve as the advisory board for this project. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Stephanie from our office to go ahead and present the changes that you're going to be seeing in the code and addendum in your packet. Okay, so I'm gonna talk through some of these proposed changes. Through our gap and opportunity analysis, we found that there are very few changes that are actually required for the city to continue to meet the conditions of the municipal stormwater permit. Most of the changes that we're proposing here tonight are based on staff feedback and input on potential um, improvements to the code and the addendum based on their experience using these tools. So starting with the stormwater code, which is SDC 2103-050, the biggest change we are making is adopting the 2021 King County Surface Water Design Manual with the updated Sammamish addendum. Um, this is really the main change that needs to happen in order for the city to maintain compliance with those permit requirements. We've also updated a couple of dates where that's been necessary. We've clarified some references in the code to the stormwater pollution prevention manual. That's a term that comes up a couple of times in uh, the stormwater code. The current code does not clarify um, which jurisdictions document that is. And we've clarified that that is a King County document. So we've added that in to make sure that that's nice and clear. We've also updated the definition of critical drainage areas. This was based on feedback from staff that there's been a little bit of confusion in terms of interpreting that definition um, and how it interacts with the definition of flood, ha flood hazard areas. So we have rearranged some of the text on that definition to clarify that and uh, clear up any um, miscommunication there. As for the addendum, we've again updated any references to the 2021 King County Manual. Um, this includes updating page numbers, making sure that those are up to date. We've also updated all references to the Sammamish Municipal Code and the Sammamish Unified Development Code since some things have been rearranged since the addendum was written. So making sure again that those references are up to date. We've updated any dates, links, and references to forms and permits as needed. Uh, if there have been any changes there, we've made sure that those are updated in the most recent addendum. We've made a couple of process and text clarifications, um, not changing the substance of the text, but just adding a little bit more context or rewording some things based on staff feedback to provide clarity. We've cleaned up formatting in a couple of places as well, as well as any inconsistencies within the addendum itself. Um, there were a couple of cases where there were there was conflicting information on different pages of the addendum. So we've worked with staff to clear those up and make sure that those are correct in the newest version. We've also removed any redundant content uh, as we've uh, identified that. There are a couple of places where the addendum um, repeats things that are in the 2021 King County Manual, and since the addendum is intended to modify or add more information to the manual, um, we've removed those um, components where the addendum is the same as what's in the manual. We've also added some internal references. There are a couple of places where the city's public work standards are relevant but weren't currently referenced in the addendum, so we've added those in um, where staff have identified them as applicable. We also added in an intro section on the vesting of stormwater regulations. This is text that is currently on the city's website. We wanted to make sure that was consolidated in the addendum as well, just to clarify um, which stormwater regulations uh, project uh, must comply with based on when uh, it was permitted and on when construction began. So making sure that information is not only on the city website, but also in the addendum. We've also added some references to the low impact development code and lake management plans code, since these are code sections that are relevant to stormwater management and weren't currently referenced, um, just to enhance connections across the addendum and the city's code. We updated that definition of critical drainage area in the addendum to match uh, our proposed updated definition in the code. We've also clarified some city processes specifically pertaining to drainage adjustments and when those are type one or type two land use decisions. Staff had already drafted some text on this topic area, so we consolidated that into the addendum. We've added a flowchart of drainage review requirements to provide graphic representation of when drainage review is required, again, to add clarity to the document. 
We've also added a requirement for type one catch basins where King County requires a yard drain or a catch basin in Appendix C of the manual, which is simplified drainage requirements. Staff had recommended this change because they've found that yard drains often have maintenance concerns and um, often are difficult to clean properly. And so staff recommended that in those cases where King County allows a yard drain or a catch basin, that Sammamish allow a type one catch basin. We've also recommended updating the addendum to allow for the use of PVC pipe. The current addendum does not allow for the use of PVC pipe, but the King County manual does. Um, so the addendum will be deferring to the King County manual based on this change. Uh, this would only allow PVC in privately maintained systems or in right of way as allowed by public work standards. And staff found that because this is commonly used in small private drainage systems, uh, that it makes sense to include it and allow it uh, as the King County manual does. We've also proposed modifying uh, pipe sizes, so allowing exceptions for eight inch pipe to be used in the road right of way when necessary. The current minimum pipe size is 12 inches and staff recommended uh, just allowing some flexibility there for um, minimum of eight inches in the road right of way in cases where that might be needed. We've added some criteria for interpretive signage. Interpretive signage is one of the amenities that developers can include in a stormwater um, facility in order to receive credit for a recreation space. And there's no existing criteria for this interpretive signage. So we've added that in to make sure that the interpretive signage that is used is high quality, that it's placed in appropriate areas and that it's made of long lasting materials. We've also added, added a graphic to explain setbacks for drainage easements on residential lots. Again, to just provide some clarity and a graphic representation of something that can sometimes be confusing for readers. We've removed the requirement for subdivision projects to construct operational flow control BMPs prior to reporting a final plat or binding site plan. Staff identified that this um, is no longer applicable because credits for these BMPs are no longer allowed to reduce the size of the flow control facility. Um, they are optional during um, site development. And so we've removed this requirement since this is no longer applicable. We've also added some more detail on criteria and process for granting drainage adjustments. Again, staff had drafted some policy language on this, the criteria that they consider uh, for drainage adjustment applications and the process for granting those. So we have consolidated that into the addendum as well. We've also added a clarification that the city uh, in certain circumstances can allow drainage facilities and tracks owned by an HOA with an easement for the city instead of a tract being dedicated to the city. So for example, in a recreational tract with stormwater facility, um, there may be cases where they wouldn't require that uh, tract to be dedicated to the city, but an easement in that case. We've also clarified that HOAs are responsible for maintaining fountains where those are placed in stormwater ponds. And then we've added some details on artificial turf and when that's considered an impervious versus pervious surface. This is again, based on uh, draft policy language that staff had drafted, as this is a question that comes up rather frequently. And this also includes information about when turf is considered a um, pollution generating surface. And then finally, we've added in existing stormwater facility signage guidelines to the addendum. Uh, these guidelines are currently on the city website. We wanted to consolidate those into the addendum. Um, King County's manual does have its own signage guidelines for King County. So we wanted to make sure that the city's um, signage guidelines were easy to access as well. So I'll hand it back over to Brittany to talk about schedule and next steps. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. So I'll go through the project schedule. We began the project in January where we briefed the city council and began working on a gap analysis of the city's existing stormwater code and manual to determine the scope of the amendments. Uh, we then were here at the planning commission in February where we provided a briefing on the results of the gap analysis and the potential code amendments that we would be considering. And so where we're at now, we've prepared the draft code amendments and the amendments to the Sammamish addendum, which you've just heard uh, and these are now available for review and feedback from the Planning Commission. Within our project schedule, we do have one additional meeting before the Planning Commission, and that's scheduled for April 21st. It's also scheduled to be a public hearing on the proposed amendment. 
And then we are scheduled to go to the city council on May 10th, June 7th, and June 21st, which is also when we plan for adoption to occur in order to meet the city's June 30th requirement. So for next steps, we're now seeking feedback from the Planning Commission on the amendments to the city's stormwater code and the addendum. As Stephanie had mentioned, we're going to be tracking, tracking all of the comments and questions that we hear from the Planning Commission and the public tonight, as well as those that we heard at the public meeting on the 31st in a decision matrix, which will be presented to the Planning Commission at the public hearing on April 21st. We'll also be working on updating any forms and training documents between now and June 30th, so that way the city is in a good position to implement the stormwater manual and addendum once it's uh, adopted by city council. And at your next meeting, our goal would be for the Planning Commission to provide a recommendation to the City Council. And then, as I mentioned, we intend for the City Council to adopt the amendments and the addendum at their June 21st meeting, filling, fulfilling the City's requirements under the NPDES permit to adopt the stormwater manual by June 30th. And that concludes our presentation for this evening. I know that was a lot of detail to throw at you. Um, so if there are any questions, we are here uh, to try and answer them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I wanna ask the commissioners if they have any, any questions. Jerry, do you have one? I see you came off mute. There you go. Okay, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Hi there. Yes, this question is uh, uh, Evan probably, but uh, on page 44 of the material that was provided, there's a classification of areas maps when the city and critical slope areas, et cetera. And I wondered who, who, who created that map and when is it, how current might that map be? That's you a good need question. To answer me right now. You could, I think, when sure. I think I might need to follow up with staff, other, other staff and uh, get you an answer on that, but I can follow up via email. Okay. Thank you very much. And the other question was, on the vesting timelines, I wondered if those are something from the past or are those established currently for some specific reason? How, how are the vesting dates uh, come up with or calculated? And the same, you could get back to me. There's no urgency. I can take that one. Thank you. Uh, so the vesting dates for projects permitted under our you know, adopted stormwater manual are um, stipulated by the NPDES permit. So we took that paragraph right from the language from the Department of Ecology um, for that vesting requirement. There have been some court cases that set those um, timelines. So- Thank you. Yeah. That, that answers it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Jerry, is that the end of your questions? All right, Mike, go ahead. And just, uh, I think fairly straightforward here, but on the presentation page six or changes slide six, I uh, talked about removing requirement for subdivision projects to construct operational flow control BP, uh, MPs. Um, could you give a little bit of background and the, the rationale for removing that requirement? Sure. Yeah. Stephanie, do you want to, sorry, Stephanie, you want to sure. take that one? Yeah. Um, so this requirement was put in place in the previous adoption of flow control BMPs because when a developer chose to install BMPs on each individual lot, they had the option to take credit for the stormwater being managed on each lot in the size of their facility, which so they could reduce the size of their facility. And at that time we decided, okay, if that's happening and their facility is going to be smaller because all of these small BMPs are taking some of that water, we wanna ensure those are constructed ahead of that. The update to the 2021 manual actually takes away the credit for those flow control BMPs on individual lots for everything but full dispersion and full infiltration, I think, and maybe agricultural dispersion, which doesn't apply in the city. So it's no longer relevant because they're not getting credit for those anymore. Makes sense, thank you. Okay, uh, 
Okay, uh, TC, I want to give you a chance to ask any questions if you have any. Questions at the moment. Okay. Um, I want to, I've got a few to ask, but I want to go back to Mike's question and ask the, the change was made by King County. So it supersedes anything that we do. And so is that the rationale? Did I understand that right? Yes. Um, but if we wanted in our addendum, we could consider allowing credit for BMPs, but we agreed with that change because these individual lot BMPs are actually quite difficult for us to inspect and ensure they're maintained. We, so we do inspect low impact development BMPs on individual lots annually, um, but homeowners often don't know about their devices or you know haven't um, necessarily cleaned them out. And so they may not be functioning properly for a while. So we get into sometimes a difficult situation of you know, enforcing that maintenance, do we end up fining them? And so we're actually looking into, um, we always do education first, but there is a point, I think, where if over three years they still haven't done that maintenance, we might have to look at some enforcement to get that to happen. So um, it's onerous, I think, on the city to ensure those BMPs are being maintained. Um, and so I think that's why King County took it out with that feedback. Um, and so we agreed with that change. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so a couple of questions. First one, pretty easy. On page 73, there's a link to the city website um, and there might be more. I'm just curious, are those links only updated when we go through this process of updating this uh, manual or are they updated on a regular basis? because we're getting a new website potentially this year, which would invalidate all of our upcoming links. So I'm just curious if there's a way to make sure those stay up to date. And it's not, I don't need an answer to it. I'm just calling attention to that. Um, then on page 80, there's the word concerted effort. Um, and I'll let you take a second to get there because I didn't write down what I was taking, writing my question. Um, Downstream easements cannot be secured from property owners. The applicant must submit documentation showing a concerted effort to obtain such easement. Is that a, is there a legal definition for what concerted effort means, or could the definition change based on you know a new staff member looking at the documentation? That's a good question. I don't know. Um what a legal definition for that might be. But I can say what we've been doing as far as a concerted effort is requiring that the applicant submit the information that they attempted to get the easement by sending um, certified letters um, to that um, property owner downstream of them. Okay, I don't know if if that's a written policy somewhere or if it might need to be thrown in here about what the expectation is so that one property owner isn't treated differently than another one based on, you know, so I don't know if that's needed or not, but just calling attention to it. Page 85, there's code pulled from, uh, it says the draft uh, public works policy nine. Um, and the word draft uh, caught my attention and I was wondering if it makes sense to, I mean, is, is the intent to keep that whole language in there or maybe just reference it or the draft is what's uh, concerning me. Are you referring to the drafting note on that page? I am, yes. Okay, yes, the intent is that that text would come out. And it would just be a reference then? The draft policy nine or yeah the above text was added from draft uh, policy nine yes so to explain um staff went through and developed some policies that were drafts that we never you know got officially approved but it was used as our way of being consistent in how we were applying certain requirements and so um, by adding it to the addendum it officially adopts it as an approved you know regulation which makes that draft policy irrelevant. Um, so that's just the drafting note explaining where it came from. 
Got it. So this is different than the public works design manual or, or whatever it is that has to go through city council approval. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so this was first, I just want to compliment the drafting notes. It was really helpful to have those in there to understand the context of the red lines. So thank you for, for adding that in there. Um, there's a lot to go through on this. And I was curious about what time frame would be most acceptable for staff to receive questions from the planning commission before the public hearing to be able to provide us with answers that would be acceptable for us to explain whatever decision we make to the public. What's a, what's a good buffer time for you? Okay, Brittany, do you wanna take that one? Sure. So if I think if we're providing any like written responses, we need to get those in by the 13th. If I'm correct. Uh, so if it was going to be like a written response, which we intend to provide a, a, a matrix of any of the questions that we're hearing from you tonight with responses, um, I think we would need them by the 13th into the city. So ideally maybe by the 11th or the 12th, but we could certainly provide some verbal responses, I think, to, um, to you in our presentation at the public hearing, uh, perhaps if you got those in by Monday the 18th. Okay, thank you. It's good to, good to know so I can plan my <laughs> reading time. Um, I wanna open it back up to any other commissioners if they have other TC. Yep, I'm here trying to figure out if my hand is up or down at this point. I don't know. There we go. Okay, I think I got it. Um, I wanted to look at page 66, the section projects permitted under earlier versions. Um, why, why are we giving a five-year grace period to start projects What, and not a shorter grace period. Uh, so this is that language that we pulled from the NPDES permit um, okay. that does allow some vesting for a project. So it, it has a little bit to do with the land use application process. And when a, a subdivision comes in for application, they're vested to that um, those requirements. But at the same time, like development regulations don't vest. And so there's this, this is the window effectively that the courts have decided there was, I forget what case it was. I don't know, Brittany, if you know. I, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. I didn't make the connection that this was the vesting schedule. I do have a follow-up question though. Uh, and, and that is once construction has technically started in accordance with the way it's outlined within the code, proposal here, when does real work actually need to commence, right? If somebody has a project that they've gotten a permit on <clears throat> and they do the start construction, can they leave the lot sat for 10 years and say, well, construction started, but now it's on hold? Right. Good question. Um, no, they can't. Uh, the construction would be done under a city clearing and grading permit, or it's also been known as a site development permit. And I believe those typically have a two-year um, expiration period. I think there, this would be better answered probably by Department of Community Development. Um, but I think it's typically two years. Okay. It's, and, and I think to me, it, it suffice to say that if there is an expiration date, I just don't want to see somebody coming in doing a bunch of grading work in order to meet the bare minimum requirements so as to not have to redesign something. So it, they, they actually have to be moving along in a timely manner. So I, I appreciate the answers. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from other commissioners? Yes, Mr. Chairman. There we go. go. Ahead. 
I can't manipulate the raise hand screen and the mute screen at the same time. <laughs> I'm curious, you said that you had a public uh, event open house and it's only six people showed up. And I'm curious if those six people were actively involved in development or what kind of feedback might have, have you received from the people that did show up? So we actually did a poll at the beginning of the public meeting on the 31st, and I believe all six were members of the public, homeowners, um, people who were involved in um, stormwater advocacy, uh, Ms. Wichter, who's here tonight, um, Mr. Stickney, who's here tonight as well. Um, and then there was a few other additional um, people in attendance, which I don't have their names in front of me, but I believe they were all generally representing um, homeowners or residents of the city of Sammamish. And have you got any feedback that you would like to share from what they had to say at that open house or? Sure, yeah. Um, so no, we, we thought it was a really good meeting. We had a lot of um, conversation back and forth. It was a virtual meeting similar to our meeting tonight. Um, so these are always challenging, but I think we had a good conversation about um, the changes, which I think you've kind of seen tonight are fairly routine, not super exciting changes. Um, but there were some good questions about how um, stormwater drainage review is conducted in the city, some questions about vesting, um, similar to the questions that the commissioners have had tonight. So I think having some of those uh, questions were helpful to inform how the stormwater manual is applied in the city. Um, we talked about um, artificial, the use of artificial turf, um, the use of uh, eight inch pipes and PVC in the pipe design requirements. Um, and we talked about the inter the interpretive signage uh, criteria that were added into the addendum. Um, I think I'm just looking at my notes. Um, those were kind of generally some of the, the comments and questions about uh, the updates. And then again, just some conversation about how stormwater review is conducted for new and redevelopment. Thank you, and that's helpful, thank you. If I could add, um, on the Connect Sammamish web page for the project, I'll put that in the chat. Uh, we do have the recording of that meeting for any of you or any of the public who's interested in watching either the presentation, which actually is very similar to what we talked about tonight, or uh, the questions toward the end. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions before we move on to the next item? All right, uh, Stephanie, Brittany, Stephanie, thank you very much for your presentation and, and walking us through our, our questions. We appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Okay, next up is agenda public comment. Evan, um, do we need to read the accessibility statement again, or can we uh, move on to those who are here for public comment? I think we can go ahead and skip the accessibility comment, but I will just make a note to please raise your hand, or if you're dialing in via phone, uh, press star nine to raise your hand, and it looks like we have one uh, commenter. I will go ahead and promote them now. Ms. Wichter, the floor is yours. Hi, Mary Wichter again, Sammamish, Washington. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank the really excellent staff that I think that we have at the city, particularly for stormwater, but public works and other places too. Um, the changes all looked very carefully read and, and carefully done. So it was easy to see what was happening um, through the red lines. Um, I didn't really have any issues, there's little things I'll email and I was working on it today and just didn't get it done. Um, but just a couple things I can think of is, um, I must live in Tamarack where there's uh, existing vacant lots that are not in a subdivision and we see new development on them and new development that starts and tries and stalls out for a really long time, which is why I got involved in the beginning. Um, but I have never tried to trace the code through for a redevelopment project. So um, one thing that would concern me about redevelopment is I'm sure somewhere in the code, 
I don't think it's in the stormwater code, it's in the other code. There's probably a set threshold for um, how much you're changing or the percent of the price or a price number. And one of the concerns I have with that is the housing crisis and market is so crazy right now that whatever that level is, it's probably far too low. Like it would look like, oh, you're not redevelopment, you're just you know fixing things because the, the value of the houses are, are so much. So I don't know if that can be looked at with this, um, just particularly because I think it's probably an old value. And then with the housing crisis, I think it's probably not sufficient in its number, but I don't think that's in the stormwater code, but I don't actually remember where it is. Um, I am concerned about the eight inch pipe. Um, the city kind of put it in there. Stephanie had said before that she didn't really know how it would be used. I definitely have seen places where an eight inch pipe just isn't big enough for the capacity that it needs. I've seen six inch pipe and I've seen all those are supposed to be where there's 12 inch pipe, basically the code from long ago through King County manual, through King County road standards for ditches, culverts and driveways is supposed to be used. And it's a 12 inch minimum. Anytime, as soon as you get off your parcel, and you get into the easement area, you need 12 inches. And if you've ever used your hands to clean out a culvert, you'll understand eight inches and six inches is really hard to clear. And that 12 inches you can do. And I actually have like a hoe that looks like a, well, it looks like a hoe, but it's a drainage tool. And I have an eight inch one and 12 inch and they're very hard to use. So I really don't suggest that we go with the smaller size. And if someone needed one, there's probably a variance or an adjustment or something they can do. And what's good about that, isn't it? is decided by the director, but it goes to the hearing examiner. And then the poor downhill person who gets stuck with the pipe um, gets to actually have a say, otherwise it just goes through officially. So I, I really, unless there's a real reason for it, I just don't see that. Um, it was nice that they explained the pipe types tonight, um, the PVC, why they were using them. It looks like corrugated pipes are out, which is good because they're usually not as strong, but the double wall do have corrugation sometimes on the outside. It wasn't clear to me if those are, are changed too. I know PVC pipe is a little bit more flexible, but also if you're driving heavy equipment over PVC and if you don't have enough cover, um, you get you crush the pipes. And I've also seen that happen. They, they break or whatever, and plastic is just a little bit more brittle over a long time, and particularly if it's exposed to UV. Um, so I'm not feeling really good about those changes, particularly not the eight inch pipe size in roadways or easement areas. Um, and then the probably the pipe types are okay if they match with this, uh, the city, or excuse me, the county has done. Um, on other things I noticed, uh, I like the flow chart that they added. I like the diagram that they added to show how the easements work because I think that really clarifies it for a lot of people. On the easement, um, the comment that Josh made about page 80 with uh, that you tried hard to get an easement, like what does try hard mean? Um, with drainage, if you're going to put it downhill, it does need to go somewhere. And the code as of 1-1 of 2017, you're not supposed to affect downhill areas and whatever you build is supposed to work in full build out conditions. And that might mean that if you can't keep the water, water, the prop, the water on your property and you need to put it somewhere you wanna put it downhill and probably your downhill neighbor doesn't want it if there's no facilities um, and that's really a problem. So I think just showing that you tried to get an easement and couldn't isn't necessarily good. Um, there are places in the city that do not have stormwater infrastructure they're older, it's never been developed. And I think the city really should get involved in getting easements that are needed for those areas. I know Sammamish Plateau Water and Sewer District goes out and they will ask for, they will pay for, they will do condemnation if needed or threat of condemnation to get an easement if they really need to put sewer or water somewhere instead of running it around people's properties, particularly in these old plots where you don't have roads or they were done before subdivision and you need to get through. So. Um, I, I thought Josh's questions were extremely well placed on that. And then I just think that if easements are needed, there there needs to be something that happens to do them because you just can't say, oh, I couldn't do it. And then the stormwater runs downhill because that shouldn't be allowed anymore by code. And I live in an area where that's happened in the past and it's not a good thing. Um, there are a couple places where there are small changes, but I can just write those up. And Josh also thank you for asking about the time frame for doing that for the city and consultant to process them. And um, on the LID BMPs, we had some good questions on that. Um, the problem with LID BMPs is you have to leave native soils and you, you can install it later. So I don't really know how subdivisions are gonna do that because I'm used to clearing and grading everything. But if the LID best management practice does not work for low impact development, 
um, it does need to go into a drainage facility. So that's why King County removed that. So you have that you can't get a reduced size, find out it doesn't work, and then nobody has a solution for it later. Um, there was one question, um, I think it was in what I read about um, the thresholds, uh, should they be changed or not? And I think there's one place in the code that says 500 square feet for a landslide hazard area uh, or landslide hazard drainage area. And I think those are now zero and 200, so that might need to get changed. Um, otherwise, most of the stuff I saw, uh, I've either written up or respond to in writing. Um, I can't think of other things I saw that were particularly difficult. Um, I did attend the open house and it was really nice to have that format where you can ask questions and they respond to you and get back. It is recorded and I know that they follow up on that. So anyway, it seems like it's a really well done project um, that if we do have any questions, we should definitely make sure that those get in so they can be responded to because there's only one public hearing that's upcoming, then it goes to city council and hopefully it will flow through. So thank you all for your work and what you did today and what you'll be doing for the upcoming. I just really appreciate everybody's input. It makes better project, better code, and a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wichter. We do have one more comment. I will go ahead and promote them to panelists. Mr. Stickney, whenever you're ready. Hello, Planning Commissioners. It's Paul Stickney Sammamish. Um, good presentation tonight. I enjoyed attending the Stormwater Open House on the 31st and as I recall, I was there, so was Mary, I believe. Uh, Sharon Steinbus was there, if I have that correct. And I believe a couple folks, Mary and Eric uh, Johnson were there that live in the Inglewood area, if I have that, that right. But it, it, it was a good meeting. Um, one of the things I asked during that Stormwater Open House I got a clarification on which, um, you know, um, precipitated my non-agenda comment today. And that is that what the city had referred to as E8 and E9 in the work plan that is now E4 and E5 are not a part of what is before you tonight. The reason I had asked about it is that one of the prior meetings in front of the Planning Commission for these updates to the King County Surface Water Design Manual and Sammamish Addendum, there were a couple slides at the end of that presentation that had listed E8 and E9. So I was just curious if the two were tied together or were separate and, you know, distinct. And they cleared that up and did a good job during the open house that they are not tied together. They are separate animals, if you will. So that was that was uh, good news. Something else I asked about, and they had an answer, and I will admit that it didn't sink in my head maybe the way it should have. So I'm going to repose the question statement combination for consideration of potentially putting it into the code. But a little context first. And by the way, in going through the package, I agree with uh, Commissioner Amato, that the context statements were quite helpful. And in general, I didn't see much of any red flags in any of this. And I defer to Mary's expertise, who can run circles around me into all the detail, but nothing showed up here that jumped out at me. Oh, my goodness, that needs to be fixed. I think it seems reasonable. The context I want to provide is the order of magnitude of change that happened from the 2009 code to the 2016 code. And Mary taught me a good word several years ago, you know, bifurcated. The reason I apply that is, and, I, and Mary can correct this if, if I get this messed up, she can put it in her comments that she sends to you. But prior to 2016, for projects on an acre or less, I believe Sammamish was using the 1998 code. On projects for over an acre, they were using a 2009 code, two different codes. 
but the change between 2000, between those two codes and 16 was a significant raising of the bar of standards for stormwater that I can sum up as saying stormwater standard in Sammamish as of 2016 is in essence meeting no more stormwater volume or a discharge off of a site that would have come off that site over a year in a pre-developed, excuse me, undeveloped forested condition. That is a monster change. That's the standard now that most cities have. And the Sammamish addendum, I can't tell you precisely what, but it was stated tonight and at several meetings, both staff and uh, you know, DCD and stormwater folks have said that Sammamish standards are even greater than that. What I can't do is tell you what exactly the Sammamish uh, addendum does that is over and above the King County Surface Water Design Manual. What I can tell you is that the King County Surface Water Design Manual essentially mandates that, and I like the word used tonight, I, I believe it was to the most extent, you know, practicable, that that your stormwater cannot exceed what would have left the site in in pre-developed forested condition. And that's a heck of a bar. That's a lot of protection, which is why in my earlier comment today, I said that I didn't believe that the others were, were necessary. Something else I talked about at the open house was, and what I'd like to suggest now, circling back, and that was the context. The vast majority of residents and homes in Sammamish have been built before the 2016 standards were in play. And some before the 2009 standards and some before the 1998 standards. So here's the question. As somebody comes in to remodel a house, what triggers what new standards they have to meet? If they add 100 square feet, do they have to meet the whole standard or just for what they're adding? Where is a matrix that lets folks know when they want to remodel or add to or alter their houses or change their impervious surface footprint, when, what new requirements do they have to meet and what can they stay under their current requirements on? And I believe the answer they told me when I asked the question, if somebody chooses to demolish a house, which is happening in many communities because land value is getting so high and many homes were built in the 70s and 80s. If somebody takes a house down, I think I heard that then that entire site has to meet the new standards, which would make sense. But I think working in some sort of a matrix that is relatively top level and, and encourages people to contact the city for all the specific 15 details, seconds, but helps them see what requirements would be necessary if they do remodeling under stormwater standards for homes that were built under older standards. Okay, but that's my comment. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Stickney. Uh, and that was the last of our public comment. Back to you, Vice Chair Mata. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move to adjourn, I'd like to look at the long-term calendar and um, looks like coming up next week, we've got the public hearing. Uh, so be sure to get your comments in on um, what we just discussed by the 13th in order for them to provide sufficient or a, a big response or a longer written response to us. Um, and we will also be going over the planning commission bylaws, which I believe was sent to us as a Word document two weeks ago. So if you have any edits to that, please send that in to uh, Evan. Um, Evan, is there anything else we need to, to know when looking at the calendar? Uh, nothing calendar related, but I'll just note, um, earlier this week I sent the Planning Commission an email saying that we were eyeing, um, targeting April 21st as our first back in-person um, Planning Commission meeting. Uh, 
we are following the lead of the city council of when we'll be returning for in-person meetings. And I believe the city council has said that they are going to postpone returning in person until the governor lifts the emergency proclamation. So uh, we will be doing the same uh, and, and that could happen between now and then, but let's um, assume that we will be doing a virtual meeting on April 21st. Uh, and that's it from, uh, that's it from me. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. second. All right, it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, have a good day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Evan.